every day. Amen. Reverend Hagler, Morning. Deacon Flowers, musicians, members and friends. Wow, they're early over here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, everybody's awake this morning. It's nice and bright and sunshiny, so that's, that helps a lot. My name is Jan Beckwith, and I am a member of the Me- Greeters Ministry, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guests. I have no guests registered this morning, but if you are visiting with us, would you please stand at this time? Okay. Well, good morning again. We are in the house of the Lord, and we get to fellowship with each other once again, and that in itself is a blessing. That in itself is a blessing. Well, I'm going to just leave you with a little message about why ice cream is good for the soul. There was a family in a restaurant, and the six-year-old asked if he could say grace. And the family bowed their heads, and the six-year-old said, God is good, God is great, thank you for the food, and I would even thank you more if mom gets us ice cream for dessert. And liberty and justice for all, amen. (laughs) Well, customers laughed because that were nearby, they heard, and then a woman says, that's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray, asking God for ice cream. Why, I never (laughs) Well, the little six-year-old burst into tears. And he says to his mom, did I do it wrong? Is God mad at me? And the mom held him and assured him that he had done a terrific job. And God was certainly not mad at him. And then an elderly gentleman approached the table. And he winked at my son, at the little boy, and he said, I happen to know what God thought, that God thought that was a great prayer. And the little boy goes, really? He says, cross my heart. And then in a theatrical whisper, he added, looking at the woman, too bad she never asked God for ice cream. A little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. (laughs) So of course the mom bought the kids ice cream at the end of the meal. And her son stared at it for a moment and then did something that she couldn't believe. He picked up his Sunday and without a word, walked over and placed it in front of the woman. With a big smile, he said to her, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes, and my soul is already good. Have a blessed day. Amen. I want to give thanks to Sister Jan Beckwith for her greeting and welcome of us all this morning, and in that same spirit, the love of Jesus Christ, I also greet you on this Sunday wonderful morning. Amen? Amen. 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 It's always good uh, to get up uh, on a new day. It's, 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 it's good to, to be able to get up. Amen? Somebody ought to say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to witness a new day. Uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing us through. Uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of being able to be in worship one more time. Thank you, Lord, for all wonder and blessings that you have unfolded in our lives. You know, it's important when we come into worship uh, that we give some praise to God and acknowledge who God is because we really haven't began to worship until we really give God God's due. Say, thank you, Lord, for the morning, for the blessing, for the healing, for the light, for the life. Thank you, Lord, for the blossoming trees. Thank you, Lord, that there was rain to water the earth. Thank you, Lord, for even the coolness this morning and the sunshine that's going to come. Thank you, Lord, for every good and wonderful thing. With everything that is in us, we praise the Lord. Why do we praise the Lord? Because things, are, our life can get you down. But when you start praising God, you, you turn your blessing into a conqueror that defeats all the problems and troubles in your life. And you say, thank you, Lord. Sometimes you don't feel like praising the Lord. That's when you need to start praising him when you don't feel like praising the Lord. When life has gotten too much of a hold of you, that's when you give God a shout out. Say, thank you, Lord, for bringing us through, for giving us the victory, for allowing us to see see a whole nother week. We give God the praise. And I invite you today, uh, as we come into this household of worship, to give God praise and to thank the Lord for blessing us, to share the love of Jesus with your neighbor. Why? Because we are blessed, and that's a part of the blessings that we share, is we share the love of neighbor. It reads in the scripture says, he first loved us. And when we read that he first loved us, that's a gift God gave to us. We didn't do anything to deserve that love, but God loves us. And so we're invited to share that love with somebody recognizing that it is a gift that God has given to us. I invite you to share the peace, the love of Christ with your neighbor. May the peace of Christ be with you. It also is a gift.
Share that with your sisters and brothers. As we draw back in uh, to our worship, uh, I want uh, all of those who uh, volunteered yesterday uh, in one form or fashion uh, to make our fish fry a very successful one, even in the rain. Just stand for a moment so that we can salute you. Amen. Hey, just stand. Amen. Amen. Yes. And, 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 we're gonna, and we're gonna see Leola over there who is not standing. Amen. Amen. And I, uh, we had a very tremendous uh, day yesterday. Uh, I think everybody who was here can attest to that. The, the, the camaraderie was uh, strong, uh, the uh, uh, people working together, uh, and uh, people patronizing uh, our fish fry from near and far uh, was a tremendous, tremendous. Uh, uh, event. Uh, when I woke up yesterday morning, I was uh, a student of pessimism. I said, ah, that rain, we, the day is going to be a bus. But we need to go and just push through it anyway. And to, and to uh, our, our, our surprise, people were standing in line. And, uh, and that continued all the way up until the time we closed. And I want to also thank Brother Howard Bracey. Who, who cooked from morning until it was over with, right? And uh, 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 chasing everybody out of his kitchen under the tent or in the parking lot. They, but but we, we rejoice in, in all 
of the blessings that we were blessed with. And so, uh, again, thank you, everyone, for your patronage, your work, your support, your love, your prayers. Uh, and uh, it was truly functioning as the church yesterday of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I want to remind you of our midweek services on Thursdays at 6.30. Come and be blessed in our services. There's also Bible study on Thursdays at 12 noon. On Wednesdays at 6 a.m., we have our prayer conference call. You can see the information in the bulletin. Uh, I urge that you use a cell phone to call in, and that way you avoid any type of toll uh, charges. On next Saturday, there is the climate march in Washington, D.C. You, you notice how many marches have had to come to Washington, D.C. since uh, this, this group of folk got elected? Amen. It, it, it's, it's, you got one at least every week. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes you got three or four in the week. Um, and so uh, we're going to have a climate march next Saturday, and United Church of Christ has a strong contingent in that march uh, uh, as they leave. Uh, and so uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very exciting thing. And then on that evening, that same evening after the march uh, at 7 p.m., uh, Amy Goodman uh, from Democracy Now! will be here at Plymouth Church and We'll be, this, we'll be speaking, and uh, if you ever had a chance to hear uh, Amy Goodman on Democracy Now!, she's always been cited as a breath of fresh air in terms of reporting and journalism, uh, and she always fills the house, uh, and she has decided that her presence here uh, in Plymouth is going to be as a benefit for Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ and WPFW. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, don't forget me in revival. Okay, that's, uh, when is that? The 26th, 27th, 28th, right? 26th, 27th, and 28th at First uh, Baptist Church on, uh, on Randolph in New Hampshire. Uh, but, but come and make sure you let folks know to come and be at the Amy Goodman event. It's, uh, it's a very important event. And it's also very important because it's one of those times where someone is contributing their time and talent to support Plymouth Church, right? Uh, uh, I, w I want to be clear. Amy is not getting an honorarium to speak at this event, right? Uh, uh, the, the, she just called and said, let us, let us, we can do this. And I said, sure, we can do this, amen? And so come and be uh, blessed by it. Also, I want to point out Brother Maceo Kemp and friends scheduled for their benefit concert on May 21st at five. So keep that before us as we sort of go through these weeks and months, uh, uh, all of the uh, many, many, many different ways and things that are sort of coming together to sort of lift up the church. Uh, and it just gives you, uh, it, it makes me feel excited. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel excited uh, to, to see the church uh, uh, just alive uh, and, and acting like it's alive. Uh, and, and, and saying simply, we can do this, we can do this. It, it's such a wonderful feeling to see. And, and, and I, I just go back to yesterday because the laughter the, uh, that took place as people were working was something that was just a blessing from God. Uh, and so I, I just want to point that God has God's hand in and upon all of this. And so we're thankful to the Lord. So now it's that time that we prepare to bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts into the house of the Lord, for God has blessed each of us abundantly, richly, wonderfully. God has given to us and fed us and clothed us. God has allowed us to see a new day and has walked with us even through the storms of life and bringing us to the victory of living. So sisters and brothers, we should be rejoicing, and a part of our rejoicing is what we, what we give. Uh, recognizing that everything that we have is a gift from God in the first place. And therefore, we render back to the Lord a portion of that which God has blessed us with. Trustees, if you will come prepare to receive the tithes and the gifts and the offering and the people of, of God, uh, be prepared to give from your hearts and your spirit out of a place of joy and thanksgiving.
let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for your mercies and your wonder. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and lifting us and blessing us. And as we come to this time of giving, Lord, allow our gifts, our offering, our tithes to truly be worthy in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. And as we receive these tithes, gifts, and offerings, receive these in a spirit where we consecrate them to your service so that the gospel might be preached and the church might continue to stand. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our text today, our scripture is from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. 1 Peter, I believe you can find it on page 1058 in the Pew Bible. 1 Peter. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, 
You believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God add a blessing to the reading of that righteous word. Let us join in a moment of prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for this word that is open to us and for us and give us the ability to open our hearts, minds, eyes, and ears and truly understand what it may be saying to us in these moments in which we stand, these hours in which we live. For one thing is certain, Lord, you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now as we come to this teaching moment, Lord, you hone it, you shape it, you develop it, you send it forth, allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take a little bit of time and speak on this subject, test it and refined. Test it and refined. Now this epistle, an epistle means letter really, this epistle, 1 Peter, purportedly to have been written by Peter but scholastically is in dispute because of the language of the letter, the crafting of the letter, and even the dating of the letter that draws suspicion as to the letter being authentically Peter's. And then you may ask the question, well, who wrote the letter? This is not really the important question because we may never fully know the authorship of the letter because names are sometimes used at a particular point in history in order to give the writings and the teachings greater weight at the time in which it is needed. The most important thing is that the letter gives us insight into the theology, the fears, and the struggle of the church and its people. If you go back earlier, you see that this letter is initially written to, quote, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. You see, this letter is written at a time of persecution for the church and for the believer. And the letter is an encouragement as well as a warning. In this regard, this letter reminds me immediately of the group letter that we know as Revelation. For example, it says in the first chapter of of Revelation, it says, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatria, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Revelation was also written as a warning and for encouragement and even as a correction to the churches of Jesus Christ. Now, 1 Peter is reminding the churches that the great gift of God realized through his teachings and God's dramatic act of the resurrection has provided a great gift. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now see, we are being reminded that we who believe in Jesus, have a new birth because of the resurrection. We are being reminded that those of us who believe in Jesus, we have a hope that is now alive because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus. This means that Easter or the day of resurrection is an accent 
that has been provided to us in life that results in new birth, a new beginning, hope that is living, or hope that is alive. And according to 1 Peter in verse 4, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, we have an enduring and enduring gifts that awaits us. One thing that the resurrection has provided is that life, this life, is a transition into the life that is ahead of us. And what we need to do is allow ourselves to be perfected in this life so that we are equipped as we go through life and able to receive the gift of the resurrection when that time comes. With knowledge of the gift of God, we should be rejoicing. We should be excited because it is a tremendous thing to understand and know that this life is only a transition into the perfection of God's glory. That, 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 that means that all the stuff that goes on in this world, yes, it happens to us, and yes, it has an impact, but sisters and brothers, we should not allow it to get us all down, bruised and beaten up and battered because we have a life and a gift that is in store for us that is undefiled, as it says, it's unfading, and it is imperishable. Now, if we can conceive of this, then we understand that our presence on this earth is to grow according to God's will, to challenge those things that detracts from the glory of God, and to be advocates for God's perfection and goodness on the earth as it is in heaven. Remember the perfect justice and the perfect love and the perfect peace of heaven? has to be our quest here on this earth in the time we have been given to live our mortal lives. This is a part, a vital part of what Jesus taught to us. Jesus said, on earth as it is in heaven. During your lifetime as it is in heaven. Joy on earth as it is in heaven. Perfection on earth as it is in heaven. Joy, justice on earth as it is in heaven. Peace on earth and among us as it is in heaven. Now, if we can conceive of this, we understand that our living is for a purpose and a mission. Now, the power of the resurrection reminds us that this life is only the preparation for new life. And to live this life to the glory of God makes us better. And it also makes the world better as part of the process. And it prepares us for new life and eternal life. You see, God didn't put us here and gave to us the gift of of, of eternal life, God's glory, in order for us to sit here and do nothing. That's not the purpose of God's sacrifice and God's overcoming. God, 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 Jesus wanted us to have a vision that, 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 yes, this life is what it is, but it can be more. That the struggles of life is what it is, but it can be more. That, 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 yes, I got to go through some stuff, but it's the stuff I go through is not the permanent stuff because there is joy that God has in store for us. It's, 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 it's this teaching in these brief verses that remind us that life is not the same because of the resurrection. <coughs> I know that we get to Easter, we go, oh, Easter, we get in our Sunday best. We sometimes, in the old days, used to put on hats and, 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 and gloves and come to church so that everybody could see us, and then Easter was over, and then we went back to living life as we lived life. The resurrection is a reality shift. The resurrection is a transformation of our spirit and of our mind. 
If you experience Resurrection Sunday, if you experience Easter, then life is no longer the same because I recognize that God has overcome the world. You see, one of the things that prevents us individually and collectively from living as beings that are able to challenge the world, to challenge the injustices of the world and those things that are wrong in the world and those things that diminish life in the world and those things that take away the hope of living in the world is fear. We are afraid to live for God. We, 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 we get afraid of things like unemployment. We get afraid of things like loss of career. Uh, maybe, maybe even being arrested and going to jail. And when it comes to revolutionary zeal, that is often the case to make for real transformation, it results in death. We had a meeting on Friday, some preachers and leaders around the country to talk about uh, organizing uh, for Martin Luther King's uh, 50th anniversary of his assassination, which will be next April 4th. And so everybody was talking about the sort of the celebratory thing. And I had to remind folk that King was killed because he talked about and began to organize for a reordering of the economic structures of the country. Gun down for daring to live for the glory of God. A country built on greed and separation and compartmentalization could not go for an idea that actually challenged the soul of the nation to be a moral nation that opens up opportunity to everyone and not just some. And it's just like they said in Genesis, they said, come, let's kill the dreamer and see what becomes of the dream. Human beings always think like that. And most of us quiver and shake at these thoughts because we want to enjoy our lives. We want to hold on to it as long as possible and not be discomforted in our living. So we hold on to life with all passion and with all power. We acquiesce to all kinds of things and injustices because we simply want to live trying to survive and trying not to make ourselves a target. We live, but not with a hope that is alive. Nor do we exude in our being new birth in the Lord. This is why the writer of 1 Peter writes to these churches suggesting in this new knowledge of a post-resurrection world, he says, rejoice. Even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, rejoice. So that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire. Now the church and the people of God awakened from a slumber and stirred by the brilliant flash of the resurrection, cannot go back to sleep and cannot be reconciled with a world that denies God or the love of God. This means that the church is persecuted and the people of God are persecuted because evil does not enjoy people of conscience or goodwill and faith challenging evil. People are persecuted because callous forces and greedy collections of people would rather not be exposed for the greed that they possess and the callousness that they have. But a people of faith growing in knowledge of God are increasingly disruptive to a world and in a world that diminishes life because of greed and the abusive amassing of power. Remember where it says in Acts, and those folks who have turned the world upside down has showed up here as well. The people of God growing in knowledge of God are no longer comfortable with a world that would rather crucify Jesus than embrace his message of love. And what I'm saying to say all of this and what I'm saying and what 1 Peter is saying is that sisters and brothers, if we live for Christ, we're going to be tested. If we live through for Christ, we're going to go through something. 
We will have something to deal with because we are a peculiar people loving the Lord more than the ways of the world. We will be tested by fire. Now, even when we go through emotional distress, it is a part of our testing. Even when we go through divorce, it's a part of our testing. Even when we go through a demotion at work, it's a part of our testing. To have a job and to work with people who are uncaring or lacking in integrity and are unscrupulous can be a testing by fire. There are many things that can be our testing. Now, when this text makes reference to gold, The two most common methods for refining gold is high temperature fire or the use of chemicals. Refining with fire is one of the oldest methods of refining metals. In ancient times, this form of refining involved the craftsman sitting next to a hot fire with molten gold in a crucible being stirred and skimmed to remove the impurities or the dross that rose to the top of the molten metal. With flames reaching temperatures in excess of 1,800 degrees, this job was definitely a dangerous occupation for the gold refiner. The tradition remains largely untouched today with the exception of a few advancements in, in safety and precision. Now, when I think of what the church went through, in its development, in its becoming. When I think of what the church went through in its struggles and stumbles, and it dealt with people within and without, and as the church attempted to define its beliefs and come to understand what that belief meant, so, so much of it was a purifying process. So much of it often was a trial by fire. The church was tested. Sometimes the church failed the test. It couldn't stand the heat. But then other times, because of the heat, the church was defined and refined to shine at various points in history. And when I think of all the stuff that we have been through as people, and yet here we are today, hopefully with a little more wisdom because of the fires, hopefully with a little more knowledge because of the fires, hopefully having grown into better human beings because of the struggles that we've been through, the problems that we face, the trials that we have gone through. Here we are. We've been through some fires where we have been melted and the impurities in us have been brought out, rising to the surface so that it could be skimmed off by God if we only let God skim the impurities off. The trials of fire have worked on us to make us better as creatures of God. This is why Paul can say, I rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us. When you go through the fires of life, when you go through the trials of life, those of us who believe and hold on to the powerful hand of God find out that we're not crushed but we're lifted up. We're, 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 we're blessed in a whole new way because we've held on to God's hand even as the fires attempted to see us. First Peter is simply saying, even with the resurrection and even with the imperishable, undefiled, and unfaded gifts that are stored up for us, there are still going to be some trials. Even during moments of rejoicing, there's going to be some trials. And even after you've been through something, there still may be more to go through. But your testing under the power of God is a purifying process where we become wiser and stronger and more spiritually equipped. Uh, if, if, if you can think of the times that you've been driven to your knees in prayer and, and you got up from that prayer, a renewed uh, human being, a person that was lifted up, a person who felt that God had a claim upon you and God was going to help you work it out, then you know what it is to be purified and refined under God's love and in God's presence. 
Every time we face some struggle or some problem, this is when we discover our impurities. When you go through something, you begin to realize, I got some stuff in me that ain't working like it should be working. I I, I got some stuff in me that brings me back to the same problem over and over again. I got some stuff in me uh, 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 that, that, that does not respond well. And I got to remove those things and, and find the things in me that God has equipped me with to be able to deal with the storms, the problems, and the troubles in life. You see, this is when we find our impurities and we find what is pure in us when we go through something and when we have to face something. When we go through the fires of life, we become purer as a people of God. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, but we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. And as I read those words, I'm reminded of all the clay vessels that I found while doing archaeology in Palestine. Whole clay pots coming out of the soil and broken clay jars coming out of the soil, existing in the dirt for thousands of years and being uncovered ages later. I think of the clay gathered and shaped on the potter's wheel. The clay is shaped into various shapes and is conceived for various purposes. The clay is shaped while it is wet on the wheel, being molded and guided. Then after it is shaped, it's set aside to dry. Uh, and, And if there's any impurity in it, when it goes into the fire, it will explode. Uh, it, uh, so the potter's job is also to help mold it and shape it and to draw the impurities out of the clay so that it might glaze smoothly and that it might fire well. But even when it's dry, uh, sitting on the side, it, it cannot be used for much. It is only when that pot of clay is glazed and fired, that it can hold something in it, that it can do something, and that it can be used for something. In other words, that clay pot got to go through some fire in order to truly live up to its purpose. That clay pot has to face some fire in order to wear its glaze like it's supposed to wear its glaze. That that clay pot, after coming out of the potter's hands, goes into the fire and is fired up and is made hard so that it can exist for thousands of years. So somebody like me can come along and and dig it up and realize that I'm holding something in my hands that's 2,000 years old, that went into the dirt but is still intact, that was there and is still held together because it went through the fire. And so sisters and brothers, don't be afraid of the fires in your life. Don't be worried about the troubles that you've got to face. Don't be worried about the problems. It is only a, a, a tool to make you be able to live for the glory and the purpose of God. You've got to go through a little fire in order to be refined and in order to be made into a vessel for the purpose that God has designed you for. It is a fire that has made the pot strong. The fire has given it longevity and strength. The fires of life helps us to understand our faith. Helps us to understand our God. Helps us to understand the crucifixion of Jesus Christ every time that we feel a little bit crucified. And how we've been equipped for a unique purpose in this life and even for the life to come. We're going to face some trials. We're going to be tested. We're going to go through some struggles. We're going to confront some problems. But for people of faith, this is the process of our refining. You know, we hear folks say, oh, thank God that God is who God says that he is. You can only make that statement 
Because God brought you through something. Right. right? God brought you through the yes, fires. Yes. Uh, 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 when we do all the stuff, when we give God the praise, yes. uh, it, it's because we know something about how the Lord has brought us through and held us together. We know something coming out of the fires of life. And we find ourselves refined as goal in the end. And this is what God is calling us for, calling us to keep on keeping on. Not give up. Don't falter. Don't fail. That sometimes the trail and the journey gets hard, but that's all right. I've learned something on those hard trails. I've learned something in those hard journeys. Going up those steep hills, I learned something about my heart. I learned something about my legs. I I learned something about my human frailty. And every time I made it over, I know it didn't come over because of my own strength or my own might. But it was God who delivered me when I could not deliver myself. But then you know that when you go through the storms of the life and you come up on the other side and know that you're not lacking but know that you're blessed. Amen? Amen. Refined and tested. We are refined and tested. Let us not sit still, and let us not be the same folks we were 20 years ago. Amen? Amen. I got news for you. Even if you want to hold on to being the person you were 20 years ago, you're lying to yourself. You ain't there. I don't think I had a belly like this 20 years ago. Don't say amen, somebody. Do not say amen, right? But what I'm getting at is that that in life, we're evolving, we're growing, we're coming through. We, we, We face challenges, but challenges are something that makes us stronger and wiser and more insightful. Challenges are stuff that allows us to understand the spiritual underpinning that is going to allow us to overcome. Well, the challenges in life reminds us that God is greater than any challenge we face. That's what the purpose of being tested and then refined. I pray somebody heard a message today. The doors of the church are open. Somebody maybe want to come and give themselves to Jesus this morning. Somebody, I pray, know what I'm talking about and want to come and present themselves to the altar today. Amen. Been waiting for you. I know. I think I was coming last time. Amen. Amen. I've been waiting. Amen. Anybody else? What is it? Four, four. Keep your hand. God's unchained the hand.
right sometime. Amen. With Brendan to come forward. Amen. <laughs> Carrie Cruz is Brendan then. Amen. Amen. And we got Amen. Sister Rachel Woodock. It's been good, amen? Amen. It is good. And we give some thanks to the Lord. All thanks and all praise to the Lord. And thank the Lord for each one of you. And as we prepare to adjourn from our worship, I'm going to invite you to stand and receive the benediction. Lord, we go forth from here. Being tested by many tests, but refined and strengthened and fortified in all things. All things by our God, who watches over us and guides us and keeps us. We remind ourselves we're coming through. We remind others you're coming through as well. Just keep your hand in God's hand and believe. We pray this prayer in the name of the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the people of God said amen, amen, and amen.